a few weeks ago, the Apostle Paul was warning Timothy about the last days, and he was warning about the appearance in the last days of false teachers and of perilous times that would come. I don't know if we've ever needed more discernment than we need in this day, and I don't know if we've ever seen less discernment than we see in this day on the part of God's people. And we've learned that there are false teachers uh, who have a form of religion, but they deny the power thereof. They deny the power thereof. Notice that again in verse 5, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. And as we con consider that thought that there are teachers who have a religious form but deny the power, then as we come to verse 6, we begin to see the definition of those teachers. We begin to see the uh, description of those teachers. And you see, the Apostle Paul is challenging Timothy because he would confront these very types of situations at Ephesus and wherever he went providing oversight for the first century churches. But not only was this for a first century audience of one, Timothy, but it's for a 21st century audience of all of us tonight who need to be aware of the characteristics of the false teachers that abound. I'm amazed actually, and sometimes, as we'll see tonight, it can happen with women, sometimes with senior saints, people that begin to support, sometimes with men that are very simple-minded, who, who begin to follow after certain things on the internet, certain books and authors, uh, who are not sound theologically, but they are charismatic in their personality, hence they begin a followership uh, of which they are not worthy according to the biblical definition. And so when we think about these that have uh, a form of religion but deny the power, I want you to notice, first of all, in our text tonight, their deviant reputation. These false teachers, have a deviant reputation. The Bible says in verse 6, for of this sort are they which creep into houses. Now, how many of you would just agree, not knowing the full extent or meaning of the passage maybe yet, how many of you would say that anybody that creeps into a house is probably not the religious leader you want to follow? How many of you are, are with me on that right there? And, and, and notice the terminology, for of this sort are they. Uh, this is the type of people they are. These types of people, the, they have a deviant reputation. It is an immoral reputation. Now, may I say about the text tonight that the, the primary meaning here is not necessarily uh, a, a sexual immorality, though that could potentially take place and certainly is a part of the connotation, but it speaks even of the lack of integrity with which they use the Bible, uh, the way that they do not rightly divide the word of truth, these false teachers. They, uh, they are very sneaky is what the text is telling us. They creep into houses. They have a lack of integrity. The Bible says in Acts 20, 29, uh, for I know this, that after my departing, Paul said, uh, de after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in unto you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. And, and so the Bible describes these false teachers as being uh, teachers who are not men of integrity. They are not following after uh, godly morals. They certainly do not have any ethics. They certainly are willing to influence everybody else's flock while they may or may not even have their own flock. And sometimes I'm amazed that certain doctrines that are proliferated by so-called pastors on the internet are men actually who have no real following in their own local church, but they simply make prey on every other local church uh, via the internet. They are not men with ethics. They are not men who come forth with their false teachings and declare it as such, but they sneak in through certain venues and avenues with their false teaching. And yes, when we say immoral, we speak of their lack of doctrinal integrity, their lack of ethics, and also uh, the sexual immorality that sometimes is proliferated through false religion. You cannot deny the fact that when someone like Brigham Young, a founder 
founder uh, of the Mormon church living not far from here in St. George, Utah with 78 wives. I don't care how you slice it, folks. These are false. These are cults. These are false teachers who have privily brought false doctrine into a cult called a church. Now, the moral standards oftentimes are lax. We've all heard stories, and by the way, whenever we hear of, of any situation, even in an evangelical or fundamental church that has uh, someone who falls into sin or someone that becomes immoral, our first response should never be, ah, figures. Our first response should be that we feel badly for the name of Jesus Christ when that happens. Those things happen in churches with right doctrine. Let's be honest about it. The way it is handled is what delineates between a church of integrity and a church that's just trying to keep the show moving along. I can think of a few very prominent uh, TV evangelists right now, some that I'm asked about often, one that's on my mind specifically tonight. I don't feel it's necessary to name the name. Nevertheless, I know for fact he left his wife. He married the church secretary. He has a large uh, television ministry. He's well known in his prophecy teachings. But I got to tell you something. In my opinion, he should not be in the pulpit preaching in a local church. The Bible's clear about that matter. And yet there comes a point when it's just more important to keep the show moving rather than to see what the Bible says. And by the way, the Bible actually says the husband of one wife. That's what the Bible actually says. But these teachers are not going to follow the truth of God's Word in that area. And then we see beyond perhaps some of these types of things that happen in churches that are just trying to keep the show going, we actually see a a complete turning away from truth and disregard of truth happening in our society today. When the the Bible talks about having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, uh, we're seeing now entire denominations that are embracing things that are unbiblical. I read this past week that the United Methodist Church now has 3,000 homosexual pastors, 3,000 of them wearing their multicolored uh, various different uh, outfits as uh, as they preach a false and damnable doctrine as they deny the teaching of God on the subject of the family. And and, and what I'm saying tonight is that uh, we're not just talking about something that is coming, we're talking about something that has come. And we need to recognize what the Bible says when we read these words that they are creeping into houses and they're creeping into churches. Listen, I, I think tonight of so many, of so many elderly Methodists and elderly Baptists who gave their money and their time so that the fundamental truths of the Bible could be taught, and now these are creeping into their churches, and they're they're teaching an entirely different doctrine. Uh, I I think of of, uh, Charles and John Wesley, whose graves I have visited, whose fields where they preached I have visited. I think of uh, Charles Wesley's prayer room, and uh, this is the room where he got up every morning at four o'clock and got on his knees and, and got alone with God. I've seen his pulpit. I've seen his desk. I've seen the chart of all the churches in London and where the different pastors preached. And I've read original sermons of Charles and John Wesley. I know what they believed about the family. I know what they believed about morality. I know what they believed about the gospel. And I'm just simply saying that men have crept in unawares and, and have taken households and have taken churches far away from where Methodism began. And so there's an immorality associated with the false teachers. And then they are cowards, these false teachers. Notice, if you would, the Bible says here in verse 6, they creep into houses. They literally uh, somehow uh, put, put upon themselves a costume, and they come in acting like they're a part of the church, acting like they believe like the church believes, acting like they believe just like they do. It's, it's curious to me sometimes to hear the cult say, oh, we believe in Jesus when they believe in an entirely different concept of Jesus Christ. Oh, we believe in Jesus too. They don't tell you that they believe in a Jesus that was a man who became a God by way of works. They don't tell you that they believe the opposite of what we believe about Jesus Christ. They are cowardly. They sneak in to deceive with their teaching. And the idea of this text, and I want to say this very carefully uh, as we look at verse 6, verse 6 says, they lead captive silly women laden with sins. 
Now, now why does God specifically mention ladies here? This is an interesting text, and it's certainly not something that is to say that women are inferior intellectually, nor are they inferior spiritually. In fact, in our church tonight, some of the strongest Christians I'm preaching to are women, and I often pray that some husbands will catch up with their wives' spirituality. But there apparently is a vulnerability that was detected by the apostle in the first century church that some of these women were especially vulnerable to these false teachers. And and we see that in this particular passage that they were being easily won over. And, And it was not necessarily for immoral purposes, though it could have led to that, but they were susceptible to the false teachings. And I think the underpinnings of this passage are showing us that no matter how uh, charismatic, no matter how fun-loving, no matter how awesome a service might seem to be, that we must try the spirits to see whether they be of God. And the fact of the matter is, no matter if a false teacher is, uh, is, is very uh, well-dressed or very articulate, uh, they were coming in in a cowardly way, professing to be spiritual advisors, but they were truly false teachers indeed. And I want to say tonight, beware of people who have that extra spiritual word. People who say, you know, that's a good message the pastor preached, but let me just tell you something else that he left out. Let me just give you a little extra knowledge on this or that. You know, it's good that you have Jesus, but have you ever considered the fullness? Have you ever considered the full gospel? By the way, if someone asks you that, the full gospel can be found in John 3.16. But, but these cowards, they don't come to the pastor. They come around the pastor. They often don't come to the church. They come around the church. And, and, and beware of those saying, listen, you know, this is good, but hey, why don't you just read this little article? Why don't you just watch this little bit here on YouTube? They have a deviant reputation. They don't confront the spiritual authority. They don't come right out. And I'm thinking tonight of so many uh, different teachers that say so many good things, but then when you begin to really listen, you'll find uh, that they're wrong on this doctrine or they're wrong on that doctrine or they're involved in some perversion of the gospel. They're involved in something that leads to lascivious living. And I just challenge you tonight to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Listen now, rightly dividing the word of truth. And that means cutting it straight. That means properly interpreting. That means seeking out the meaning of the word of God and following always after the word of God. Why? Because there are false teachers with deviant reputations who will come in and they will be asked acting like they're religious. They may have religious garb. They may even stand behind a pulpit. They may have a great following on the internet, but be careful that you rightly discern and that you are following after the Word of God and faithfully pursuing the truth and guided by the Holy Spirit every step of the way. These false teachers have a deviant reputation. Notice, secondly, they, of course, have deceived followers. They have deceived followers. Now, look at verse 6. The Bible says, For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. Now, false religion does not serve, it only uses. In in other words, some false radio teacher, some false teacher on the internet who wants to get you into some uh, form of licensed living so that you can feel good about your sin... Some false teacher that's going to tell you uh, that the Christian life is more emotional, it's not such a local church matter. Some false teacher that's going to peddle this type of thing. I want you just to think about it. Before you start supporting them, before you start saying how superior they are, why don't you ask yourself if they're going to visit you at the hospital next time you're in the hospital? Or why don't you check and see if they were in the nursery working with you this morning? Or why don't you see if they were maybe out soul winning this week? You see, their intention is not to serve with, only to use. And what happened with these silly women that were led captive? First of all, they were trapped. And I want you to see that in verse 6. The Bible says these women were led captive. They were taken into captivity. They were, if you would, they were enamored by these false teachers. Proverbs 29 and 5 says, A man that flattereth his neighbor spreadeth a net for his feet. In the transgression of an evil man there is a snare. The snare is a trap that uses a kind of bait or lure. 
The false teachers were using bait to lure these women into their trap. I don't know if they were giving flattery type of, uh, 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 of a flattery to these women. I don't know if they were offering some type of emotional support that no man should have offered. I don't know how the extent of it was. I just know that they were luring them in with a false attraction. They were tricking them into a following. Now, I'm saying that today there must be a discernment uh, as there is such a proliferation of information that we are guarding and being guided by the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. It's easy to be tricked indeed. I heard of an antique dealer that uh, uh, had a very valuable bowl in, its, uh, in his uh, store. He had this particular bowl that was a very rare bowl. Uh, it was uh, a piece of china that uh, he had purchased and held for many years. It was worth thousands of dollars. But it was being used uh, to hold the cat's food. And uh, this, particular, uh, this particular man that was there as the manager of the store, uh, he was uh, watching over the store when a customer came in, and the customer came in, and he saw that bowl with the cat's food, and he thought, man, that is a very rare bowl. That bowl is worth thousands of dollars. He said, I don't want to tip my hand in this, but I'm going to go up to that store manager and I'm going I'm to offer to buy the cat. And, 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 and then hopefully I can get the bowl with the cat. And so he went up to the manager and he said, I'd like to buy your cat. He said, I'll give you $20 for him. The owner uh, of the store resisted uh, and, uh, until the man offered him $100, at which point he, he uh, gave him the cat. And the man that was offering said, now, I assume that I get the bowl with the cat. And the owner replied, oh, no, that's my lucky bowl. I've sold 34 cats this week. <laughs> I'm just saying there's a lot of people that have an angle. They have an angle, and they're, they're working all the time uh, to trick someone in. And here we see that these uh, women were trapped. Uh, they were held, led captive, uh, if you will. And notice not only were they trapped, but they were victimized. They were victimized. The Bible says that these silly women, these easily flattered or gullible and weak-minded women, uh, that they had been flattered. And notice what it says specifically. They were led away uh, with diverse lusts. They were laden uh, with sins. Uh, they were let, laden, meaning loaded down. They were led away with diverse lusts. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, in this case, there seems to have been uh, a, a, an impressive power over them. They were persuaded to follow these particular false teachers. Kent Hughes said of this passage, thousands today change what they believe to accommodate their moral behavior. On the other hand, thousands more take up false doctrine than apostatize uh, in their actions. There is something that we often refer to as accommodating theology. That is to say, I don't really want to be involved in soul winning. Is there a theological school out there that would minimize the idea of evangelism? Because I don't like evangelism. And guess what? There are such theological schools. There are those who would say, I don't like the idea of modest apparel. I don't like the idea of, of abstinence. I don't like the idea of holy living. Is there a theological school of thought that would accommodate the way I want to live? And the answer is, yes, there are schools of thought that will make you feel very comfortable while you live a lifestyle that is not a lifestyle conforming to the image of Jesus Christ. Yes, you can find an accommodating theology. There are churches out there, there are religions out there that will make you feel comfortable living just about however you want to live. But the goal is not to live however we want to live. The goal is to live in such a way that we would please and honor the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, well, you know, I understand, you know, in the first century they probably had those problems, but, but you know, that doesn't happen a lot today. How many of you have ever heard of the Jim Jones cult? By the way, I don't have the specific numbers, but I'll just step out on a limb to say that 90% of those that drank the Kool-Aid were women. They had been attracted to a charismatic personality. They had been attracted to some relational side of that. It was not according to the Word of God. It was not exalting the Lord Jesus Christ. 
It was not causing them to go out and win their lost. Listen, one of the signs of a cult is that they want to isolate you from the lost. Listen, someone says to me, should I go to my unsaved family for Christmas? Absolutely yes. Go shine like a light for Jesus Christ there. But these silly women were led away. I was talking with one of our members at lunch today who worked at the Air Force base that had the Air Force planes that went down to South America to bring those victims' bodies back to the United States of America. And it all began because they didn't follow doctrine, they followed personality. They were trapped, they were victimized. We must understand that deviant reputation of the false teachers uh, then was followed by the deceived followers who just got caught up in that moment. And so then that leads us thirdly to the destructive pursuit of the false teachers. Not only did they mislead these people, but notice what happens here in verse 7. The Bible says, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Okay? Now, now this is a characteristic of a false teacher. Accommodating theology to their lifestyle, they continue learning more and more. One of the characteristics of false teachers, they always have something new. They always have some new twist on a verse. They always have some new revelation, some new word from God. I'm going to be honest with you folks, and I'm just being, you might say, well, pastor, you're not very smart, you're ignorant. I'm just going to be honest with you though tonight. I've been preaching here for 32 years. I haven't covered all the old truth, much less starting to make up some new truth. And the cults are always finding some new revelation, some angel that appears to them, some, some new way that they don't have to confess their sin, they don't have to repent, uh, they, they can live however they want, some new revelation. And I'm going to tell you something tonight, it is a perilous pursuit. Notice if you would what the Bible says again in verse 7, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They are ever learning. They're always getting knowledge. They're always involved in this book, that book, this seminary, uh, seminar, seminar, this idea, that idea. Solomon wrote Ecclesiastes to show how pursuing knowledge is vanity unless God is in the picture. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 12 and 12, and further by these, my son, be admonished of making many books, there is no end. And much study is a weariness of the flesh. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Listen now, church, listen. In fact, let's turn there. Sometimes I I think we need to turn more. Ecclesiastes 12, 12. Everybody turn there real quick. Let's see it. Because you want to hear the conclusion of the whole matter, don't you? It's not the conclusion of the sermon. Don't get that excited. But it's the conclusion of the whole matter. All right? And we're, we're on the third point. So you can be encouraged there too. Ecclesiastes 12, 12. Speaking of this perilous pursuit of ever learning, but never coming to the conclusion. Ecclesiastes 12, and further by these, my son, be admonished of making many books, there is no end. And much study is a weariness of the flesh. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Here it is. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Now let's read verse 13. You found it. This is the conclusion of the matter. Verse 13. Let's read it. Ready? Begin. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. For this. Do you know the conclusion of the modern day teachers today? The, The conclusion is this. I don't need to fear God. I don't even need to keep his commandments. Don't give me his commandments. Just give me Jesus. By the way, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Listen to me. If I preach to you any verse from that Bible, I'm giving you Jesus. The Word and Jesus are one and the same. Can I get a witness to that? The word, someone says, well, don't don't give me the commandments. Don't tell me how to live. Don't tell me I can't drink alcohol. Just give me Jesus. Wait a minute. You're going to get Jesus every time the Bible's open. You see, it's this perilous pursuit, finding some school of thought, some internet guru that will let you live how you want. You don't even have to confess when you sin. You can do whatever you want to do. And God says, I'll give you the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. This is the duty. And oh, we hear the internet teacher saying, and we hear the false teacher saying, oh, you don't have to, you don't have to know what the duty of man is. You see, that's the problem is that these preachers are always telling us what our duty 
is. We don't even have to have a duty. I'm going to tell you something, my friend. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, your duty is to follow his teaching and to follow his ways. And not only that, if you truly are growing in grace, it's not a duty. It becomes delight. I don't have to be here tonight. I'm glad to be here tonight. I had a great day today in church. But it's interesting to me that these that are always finding new things and new thoughts and have some little corner on the market on their little doctrine, that somehow that leads to less and less and less commitment for the Lord Jesus Christ. Perilous pursuit, ever learning but never coming to the truth. Always open to new knowledge. They do not discern what they take in. They willingly listen to any new perspective. And we see it in so many ways. We hear new renditions of thought uh, regarding communion, regarding the church, regarding soul winning, regarding grace. All of these new renditions of thought that are more of an accommodation to one's lifestyle. And then we have all of the new Bible versions that will support those lifestyles. We have the Bible version of the month club, and you'll find those that are on this new ever learning, uh, they're very happy to have many, many versions because then they can pick the one that matches their lifestyle, the Reader's Digest maybe, or the Living maybe, or whichever one that really kind of makes them feel that they're on the right track. Someone gave me some passages out of a new one just recently, and they said, take a look at it, and I, I didn't mind. I took a look at it and just kind of cursory look. They said, this is better than some of the others, and it may be. But as I was reading along in 1 Kings chapter 14, I was just noticing in the King James Bible that it used the word sodomite. And I was noticing in this new one that's supposed to be good, that we have the jury out on it. It didn't use the word sodomite. It used the word male prostitute. May I say to you there is a difference? Because the new version is trying to to imply that being a male prostitute Uh, That's bad, but being a sodomite might be okay. And what I want you to understand is that when we hear about new versions and new interpretations and new theology, somewhere along the line, we need to just come back to this old book and follow God's Word without hesitation. So reading along in this so-called new one that is the jury's still out on it, uh, 1 Peter 3.21, which says in the new one, baptism saves us now and is a response to God from a good conscience. I'm sorry, baptism doesn't save us now. It is a picture of what saved us, but it does not save us. And these little words matter. And that's why the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.21, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. And this is God's command to us, to prove it, to test it, to make sure that it is right. And God is not against our learning, but he gives us the ability to think and to examine, and he expects us to steward for his glory. The danger comes when we receive every position uncritically without evaluating it according to the word of God. And so God has called us to truly examine And to be cautious before we just swallow every new teaching that comes down the pike. I read a story recently of a 62-year-old man who was rushed to a general hospital in France. He was suffering stomach pain. His family told the doctors the man had a history of mental illness and a penchant for swallowing coins. But nothing could have prepared the doctors for the x-rays of his stomach. His stomach was filled with 350 coins. The doctors performed surgery to remove the mass. The man died of complications two days later. Do you know how to, excuse the expression, constipate your spiritual life? Do you know how to put yourself in a very perilous position spiritually by swallowing every coin that someone's throwing out to you? Oh, here's this, here's that, here this one said, this one said. Oh, there's so many shepherds. I don't think that's God's program, my friend. Be careful of the perilous pursuit of ever learning but never able to come to the truth. Notice not only is it a perilous pursuit, but notice secondly, it's an empty pursuit. It's an empty pursuit. Notice verse 7. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, folks, I want you to listen carefully about this ever learning. 
Oftentimes, by the way, we should be ever learning. But if you're learning from the Word of God, you're going to come from truth. You're going to find truth, truth, truth. You're going to find that God's Word contains the truth. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Turn in your Bible, please, to Colossians chapter 2 and verse 7. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 7. Colossians 2, 7. It says this, rooted and built up in him. Who is the him? The Lord Jesus Christ. We're to be rooted and built up in him and established in what? The? All right, look here for just a moment. The phrase, the faith, refers to a body of truth. It refers to the faith once delivered unto the saints, Jude and verse 3. It refers to the death, the burial, the resurrection. It refers to the deity. It refers to the Holy Spirit. It refers to eternal security. It refers to many different doctrines that were once delivered. And God says that we are to be rooted and we're to be grounded in the faith as you have been taught. And God says, whenever you have been taught from the Word of God, uh, the faith, then be rooted and grounded, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Verse 8, beware. Everybody say that word with me. Ready? Beware. One more time. Beware. Lest any man spoil you, which means to carry you away. Lest any man spoil you through philosophy, which is the love of wisdom and vain deceit. And oftentimes, uh, there seems to be some aura about the false teacher, and they're just more groovy, or they're more casual, or there's just something about them. God says, beware of empty philosophy and vain deceit, which are after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Now, in man's tradition, we don't like confrontational soul winning. That's embarrassing. So in man's tradition, we want to find a different way. So we want to pass out soup to the homeless, which is great. But God says, while you're passing out the soup, go ahead and pass out the gospel. Can I get an amen on that? The tradition of man is to find a non-confrontational way, an easy way, a way that makes me look good. But God says to the woman at the well, he, Jesus said, you've had five husbands. The one you have now is not your husband. At some point in time, people need to know that they are sinners who need a Savior. And we can either follow the tradition of men and be great salespeople and really make a good impression of ourselves, or we can follow the Word of God and present the truth of Jesus Christ. Look at this verse, verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. And not after Christ. Now, I think the word beware is a strong word. Well, I tell you what, when I'm out soul winning and I see it, I take it seriously. I really do. I don't want to see a Doberman pincer in somebody's front yard. Right? Now, we have the sign beware at our house. It's a total fake. I'm going to tell you that publicly. We have a new little puppy that would just lick you like crazy. There's nothing to beware about our new little puppy. But I'm not going to chance it. And hopefully someone coming to my house won't chance it either, unless they're watching on live stream. They're going to my house right now. <laughs> when I see the word beware, if I'm, if I'm out at an airport or the military base and there's a sign that says, beware, toxic storage, I'm not going to say, hmm, let me go see what that's all about. No, thank you. God says, you beware, lest any man, no one backslides alone, no one backslides alone, beware lest any man spoil you, carry you away, bye-bye. This is really hard to understand tonight, isn't it? Lest any man spoil you through, here's what they're going to use, philosophy. Well, you know, I, don't, I know the Bible says publicly and from house to house, but that's not the only way. And it's not the only way, but it's one great way. Philosophy. Well, you know, I understand that it says Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, but they're really well-meaning in what they believe, and so there maybe is a chance. No, that's not what the Bible says. That's man's philosophy. Perilous pursuits, and then, then these become empty pursuits, ever learning but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And then notice, thirdly, it's a proud pursuit. Notice this, if you would, in verse number 8. Now, as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate 
concerning the faith. Now let's read this verse together. Ready, begin. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Now here's the proud pursuit. First of all, we see their resistance. These false teachers are going to very boldly speak against the truth. They are going to withstand, and they are going to resist, and they are going to oppose. There's a cult group from the Philippines called Iglesia Ni Cristo. The head of their cult was recently detained in Hawaii because he traveled there in his private jet with several million dollars of undeclared cash and a whole cache of of uh, uh, AK-47 weapons, the head of the church just coming over for vacation. <laughs> Iglesia Ni Cristo. Their buildings have a green roof. It's kind of a spired type of a four-spired building. They have some here in California. They have them in Hawaii and, of course, all over the Philippines. A church of Christ, so-called. I remember years ago, they came to our old building, a group of them, and, and they stood in the lobby of the church, and what they wanted to do was debate. And, and, and you'll find that many times these false teachers are very bold. They're the quickest to write an email. I, I, I don't disagree. Right on that, point one, point two, point three. They're the quickest to want to debate. This group came, and they want to debate our members. They want to debate me about the deity of Jesus Christ. I talked to them for a minute, then I realized they just wanted to make a show to draw attention to themselves. We were loving, we were kind, we talked to them for a while, they kept coming back. They wanted to debate. And every time I would share with them uh, that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and every time I would share with them, great is the mystery of, God, of the gospel, uh, that God was manifest in the flesh. And every time we talked about uh, the deity of Jesus Christ, they would get filled with anger. And they would resist the Bible. Finally, we had to let them know that this was private property. And that they could go debate with the Joshua trees if they wanted to. <laughs> Their tactic was to resist the truth. Sometimes we, as Bible believing Christians, with the gifts of mercy and kindness and love, and we just kind of talk to them, and we want to be so friendly, we don't want to be unkind, but sometimes these false teachers take advantage of that. And they'll come in and begin to sow seeds of doctrinal corruption. And there's two names that are given here, Janus and Jambres. These were traditionally the names of some of Pharaoh's magicians who resisted Moses' message to let Israel go. And these, these two uh, false men, these, uh, uh, these worshipers of false gods withstood Moses, Exodus 7, and the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened, neither did he hearken unto them as the Lord had said. And it's interesting, for those of you who like to take notes, the word Janus means he who seduces, and the word Jambres means he who brings rebellion. So be careful for he who seduces because they don't put that on their shirt. They don't walk into your Bible study. They don't come to your Sunday school class and say, he who seduces. And their wives don't say, she who rebels. They normally come in going, God bless you. Let me share a further revelation with you. Let me caress your eardrums with my velvet tones. The Bible says to confess our faults one to another. Is there anything you'd like to share with me? I'll keep it just between us so I can pray for you. Janus and Jambres, you be careful for those. You be careful for those that seemingly just swoop in and have some extra revelation. Wearsby said, these men oppose Moses by imitating what he did. Satan is an imitator. Uh, he imitates what God does. Satan counterfeits. The religious leaders in the last days will have a counterfeit faith, and their purpose is to promote a lie and resist the truth of God's word. They deny the authority of the Bible and substitute human wisdom and philosophy. Whether they deny the deity of Christ, whether they deny uh, the, the uh, sanctity of marriage, uh, whether it's Scientology and, and completely deny who Jesus is and the truth of heaven, they will resist the truth and they will reject the truth. Notice that if you would. The Bible speaks of their rejection 
It says, as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do also these resist the truth. They're withstanding, they're resisting because they have corrupted and deceived minds. Paul said to Timothy, turn back to 1 Timothy for a moment, chapter 6 and verse 3. If any man teach otherwise, 1 Timothy 6, 3, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. Now notice this, from such withdraw thyself. When someone comes along and they've got such new revelation and they're just, boy, they're just sure that, you know, Dr. Sisk, he's a fool and, and uh, I'll tell you what, Dr. Kim, he may have pastored for 50 years, but this idea of praying that much, you don't have to pray that much. I mean, God already knows your heart whatever foolishness they might say, the Bible says, from such people, withdraw yourself. Well, how do you do that, Pastor? It's hard. You do it kind of like this. Hey, it's been real. (laughs) Here's another really good way. Hey, just let you know, I'm just, just for the sake of the communication, I just copied Pastor on all this so he can join our little discussion. Because he likes to discuss. He's really good at it. Just find out if those that want to creep in your little sneak room want to have that kind of a conversation. It's a proud pursuit. And God says when you see that from such, turn away. Notice what else it says about them here. It says of these men in verse 8, they were men of corrupt minds. And notice the final phrase as we close. And, And this is amazing reprobate concerning the faith. That's pretty strong. Let's say that together. Reprobate concerning the faith. Now, sometimes people use the word reprobate, and they kind of use it in a general term. But a reprobate is someone that fails the test of truth. They are theologically void of truth. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourselves, listen to this, examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? In other words, either Jesus is in you and you're saved, or you're a reprobate and you don't even know the truth. Why do the false teachers act the way they are and resist the way they do? And why do they undercut authority? And why are they so proud? I'll tell you why. Because they do not know the Lord. And so we see tonight a warning, a, a, a message that is of a warning. And I believe the context of this, you say, is there, a, is there an application maybe to a wayward Christian who's somewhat into some false teachings? That, that could be a sub-context, but the primary context of this passage is non-believing false teachers that are undermining the fundamental truths of the Word of God. I had a Mormon missionary tell me, we have lots of former Baptists that are in the Mormon church now. Either they were never saved or they never were rooted and grounded in Jesus Christ. A deviant reputation, that's the reputation of the false teachers. They had deceived followers, people that, listen, followed substance, uh, followed rather style, but not the substance. And those deceived followers had a destructive pursuit. Following the teachings of these false teachers would only lead them to a less fruitful Christian life. And I'll tell you what John 15 says, herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. How many of you want to bear much fruit? Then as my grandmother once said to me, stay out of the devil's orchard. If we're going to bear much fruit, we better stay right here in the Word of God. One verse and we're done. Turn if you would to 2 Corinthians 4 and 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 2. 2 Corinthians 4 2. Paul says here to the Corinthian church, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. Here again, speaking of false teaching, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Now, what does that mean? It means very simply that by the proper handling of the Word of God, 
combined with the living out of the Word of God, you will be able to see and know a teacher that is rightly dividing the Word of God from one that's just using the Word of God for their own means, right? So let's look at that verse again. Let's read it together and we'll be done. 2 Corinthians 4, 2, ready, begin. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the Word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. In other words, by what you say you believe and by the manifestation, that is, the way you live what you believe, people in their own conscience are going to say, there's a servant of the Lord. And by the way, that term, man of God, should not be used lightly. It should be a privileged connotation, and it should be used of someone who believes it and lives it to the honor and glory of God. And so may we have discernment in these days. And listen, may all of us in this room, men and women, be passionate for the truth. Be passionate for the truth. May it be known that we, without apology, follow Jesus Christ and the Word of God, and that we rightly divide the truth, and that we try the spirits to see whether they be of God, and that we search the Scriptures to see whether it is so. That means you've got to ask some questions about a sermon or a lesson that you hear here or that you hear somewhere else or a passage that you read and you didn't understand. You do whatever it takes so that you're following God's Word passionately with all your heart. And then be very discerning when there's a seemingly religious voice that has a form of religion, but they're denying the truth here and there. You be very careful not to apply your heart to something or someone that denies the very truth that you have been taught, Colossians chapter 2 and verse 7.